So to begin this part of our discussion, let's jump to this uh, next uh, slide number 34, financial calculations. So let's see what it says here. Uh, it actually, pro you know, it's a proposal for an example. We have a bowl of, uh, um, of ice cream, which costs $10. So the customer's happy, all right, $10. But then there is a local sale, sales tax, right? So which is 8.25% which is a fraction that looks like this, right? 0 0.0825, right? That's a fraction uh, internally. So if we wanted to apply this rate, we would simply have to take $10, let me increase the size of this somewhat, right? So we have to take this $10, multiply by the tax rate, right? Come up with this, this is the amount of tax that they have to pay, and obviously this is uh, 82 and a half cents. So, from you know, from middle school, we know that if uh, you know a typical arithmetic rounding when it takes place, what happens is that we're uh, if 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 the fraction is is half or higher, we round up. Which exactly what happened here? A result. This sort of like a little error represents the rounding operation. And so we come up with uh, zero, 0 0.83. We just round it according to everything we, we, we learn in school about rounding. But suddenly, if you sell 1,000 of uh, um, ice cream balls, the result is that you get uh, $5 uh, overpaid taxes, right? So is this an issue? Well, I don't know. Maybe a government could shut down or, you know, we could reach a... Uh, uh, ceiling of our national debt and things like that. So it, it could be serious. It, this is serious. And if you ask any banker, regardless of the fact that they operate like millions of dollars on their you know balance sheets and, and budgets and things like that in businesses, uh, very often the accounting people go to this level. They just want to reconcile there are numbers at this level, cents, regardless of the fact that they, they are operating millions of dollars because they know how big of impact that can be on the outcome of everything that they do because strange errors and, and things could creep in to um, you know, calculations, programs, databases, and so forth and so forth. So, uh, that brings us to the point where we want to say we want to stay in control of those issues and what could be the solutions given to us by our programming language, right? Perhaps our, our own programming language could give us a, a solution to those issues. So, this is where the big decimal class comes in and it's as part of, of Java library, right? So you have to import it. You have to import it from uh, the Java Math library, and uh, to construct it. So let's actually let's let's try this right away, right here. Right. So we can say mm, in our project right here. I mean, uh, it grows with all these little junk uh, uh, junk uh, variables and everything. But uh, hopefully, you can ignore the rest, so I can post the example. Uh, so uh, I will import it first, right, as big decimal. So now I have this class in scope of my package because I imported it from the library. So now I can instantiate a number, and I'll try. How about this? If I play with my uh, rates and things like that, if I say big decimal, right, uh, BG, I'll call it BG equals or BG rate. How about that? BG rate. Uh, and say BG rate um, equals new. That's how we create new objects, right? New big decimal, new big decimal, and simply use the constructor. Uh, use the constructor that takes uh, rate two, uh, rate number two, uh, right there. Okay. So I just created an object, big rate, right? Because we, we, uh, big decimal uh, uh, type of object, because we say it's going to give us the control over uh, levels of precision, 
which could be directly needed by uh, the uh, pieces of logic that we create to control rounding, comparisons, um, uh, and uh, even internal storage of numbers. So uh, we create this big ring. So let's take a look at it right away, how it looks like when we, if we try to print it. Let's just say um, big decimal right here is, and to be able to print it, now you can't really print the object itself. You really need to use a method that, that does the work. So BG rate has a method name. Obviously, it's very helpful to have uh, uh, you know, uh, help from the environment like this. But uh, this is what I'm going to use. Convert it to string, right? Just convert it to string. And just to take a look at it. Uh, run it. Uh, that looks really scary, right? <laughs> so my number actually, instead of being 851, internally, with all the precision that's available in the double structure of, of the program, it's stored it with this precision. By the way, there is a, like IEEE 74, I believe, is the standard. The uh, Actually, it's probably an ISO 754 standard that all programming tools have to uh, comply with in order to, uh, so that, you know, the, the, the double type of numbers, the floating point numbers, can be transferred over the internet and be interpreted on the, on the uh, Mac machine, on Windows, and elsewhere on a, or a mainframe supercomputer. So there's a consistency in terms of what to expect from you know standard storage of numbers. So this experiment right now showed us that if this is not what really happens under the hood. This is what happens under the hood. And uh, sometimes we want to be able to control it. Like what if we said no, 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 no. We didn't want you to store this number. This is a normal fraction. And we want to store this value. So, um, uh, let's see. Um, a little helper comes into play in this situation. Uh, there is uh, a class, another uh, uh, Java API class, a library class that can convert this double fraction internally stored in those eight bytes, which are quite substantial in terms of what they can store, right? Uh, but uh, there is a class named double, and uh, it can, it has, uh, it has a two string, I think. Uh, yeah, two string. And it takes a number, right? So it takes a number, which is our, our, our rate, or rate 2, I used before, right? which is 8.851, um, uh, and converts it to string, converts it to text, which means avoiding conversion to double, which is imminent. It's like if you use double, this is what's going to happen. You have no choice. You have no control. This is standard. right? So instead, we say, how about we convert it to string to text, which looks exactly like this, and then construct our big decimal from, from that. So uh, if I rerun this uh, again, this time I get exactly what I want. All right? So now you, the programmer, are in full control of what, so make no mistake, internally big decimal is the alternative to a double type of storage. It's really not, uh, uh, it, you can do computation with big decimal just as well as you can do computation with doubles. But doubles give you only one choice. You really go at the precision offered by the double. And you saw that precision, and that's exactly what, what it's going to use all the time. Big decimal allows you to uh, work with, uh, with numbers at the levels of precision that you choose. For example, again, uh, I could use, uh, uh, by the way, you can construct it from an integer, and you can construct it from a long integer as well, 
as well as string, which I just did. And then uh, you get these methods that are available on Big Decimal. You can add Big Decimals. You can compare them. You can divide them. You can multiply, but uh, subtract and so forth. I already used to string to convert back to text to, to be able to print it. Uh, and there is also a set scale, uh, uh, which is uh, our next big topic. Any questions about this so far? So let me save this segment.